Woman Jacka Merin Big Big Bunwarang Nam the Burapton Atawilam. Come with purpose to our beautiful home, land of the two bays. My name is Gary Yarraman Steele, and I'm a descendant of the Bunwarang people of the Kulin Nations. I would like to extend this welcome to all the First Nations groups on which, which land we, we meet and we live and we work every single day. We pay respects to their ancestors, their elders, past and present. Here today, we're meeting in Melbourne, uh, so I'd like to pay respects to my ancestors. I'd like to pay respects to those that came before me, people like my mother, uh, Nawi Carolyn Briggs, people like my great-great-grandmother, Parbanada Louisa Briggs, um, who passed down stories about the creation of this land, specifically the, how this land was created and how Bunjil, our creator spirit, carved the lands and the waters with his great spear. And then he created the Kulin people and taught us the responsibility that we have for this land. And he taught us that we had to always welcome guests, but we had to ask all guests to make two promises. The first promise, not to harm the land or the children of Bunjil. And the second promise, to honour and respect the laws of Bunjil. If we can commit ourselves to these two promises, I can say once again in the words of my ancestors, Womanjeka Merambikbik, Bunwurang Namda Brapton Atawilam. Thank you. Before Captain Cook arrived in 1770, across this land, there were hundreds of Aboriginal nations, each with their own laws, customs and ceremonies, with boundaries that defined kinship and trade, but yet in the eyes of the British, they never existed. As refugees, asylum seekers and ex-detainees in Australia, we acknowledge that the land in which we have sought and seek protection is the land of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, where sovereignty was never ceded. And I'd like to acknowledge all the, the traditional custodians of all the lands from which we're, we're gathering here today. Um, myself am on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to um, pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge and respect their uh, culture, their history and their continuing contribution to um, country and uh, culture and care for the land and the environment and the water for over 60,000 years. Um, so today we've come together as part of uh, Refugee Week 2020, officially organised by the Refugee Council of Australia. Um, it's an annual ce celebration of people who have fought safe, uh, sought safety in Australia. The Refugee Week events uh, usually seek to raise the profile of the work of these communities in arts, hospitality, business, anything else. And we'll be kicking off this week-long celebration with a deep dive into the parallels and intersections between Indigenous and refugee rights in Australia, reflecting on complex ideas of hospitality, community, diversity and tolerance uh, through Australia's past and present. We'll just be having a chat uh, with each other. Or I'll throw it to our speakers very soon to introduce themselves. Uh, but just as a, I suppose is a bit of a disclaimer we put out there. Um, I personally myself, and I'm assuming others in the panel as well, like we don't consider ourselves experts on the topics that we're talking about today or that we're touching. Um, we're just hoping to cover uh, these issues in conversation here today as a starting point for this dialogue, share out lived experiences with each other and expertise within our own respective fields. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping before we officially kick things off. Uh, the Refugee Council of Australia, uh, who have organised this event and the Refugee Week in Australia, uh, represent refugees and people seeking asylum in Australia. They conduct regular consultations with people uh, reflected affected by refugee and asylum seeker policies, and they lobby the government on behalf of uh, refugee communities within Australia for better and fairer alternatives. Um, who are they're actually currently uh, leading the Nobody Left Behind campaign, which is a coalition of many organisations coming together to call on the government to include people seeking asylum and refugees in their COVID-19 response packages. 
And if you want to or know more or uh, able to support this really important work, uh, please visit the Refugee Council page and you'll also hear from the speakers as well and all the great work that they're doing today. So please uh, do check out their great work and if you're able to support, do that as well. And the very important thing, don't forget to stay tuned after this panel and join us at Refugee Council Facebook event page for a live Q&A with some of our speakers. Um, and just quickly doing a quick thank you to the Wheeler Centre for co-hosting and organising all the tech side of things for this panel today and looking after us uh, to make sure everything runs really smoothly and also a big thank you to Grace Edward for working with the team um, and putting the, the, you know, the, the meat of this panel together. Okay, I think that's enough from me. How Throw it to our speakers to introduce themselves and um, just note that their bios have been shared on the website, the Wheeler Centre website. Um, but if you could, the speakers themselves, if you could please introduce yourself and um, very briefly in a couple of words also talk to us about what welcome means to you. I might go to Ashley. Hi, thanks Shabnam. Uh, so first I'd like to acknowledge country. Uh, I am standing and living on the lands of the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and I want to pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm a proud Nyampawa Rajari Nyamba woman from far west New South Wales. Uh, my name is Ashley Curdy and I am a uh, project manager of the Disability Royal Commission project with the First Peoples Disability Network. It is a national peak body that advocates for the rights and uh, freedoms of First Nations people with disability um, addressing systemic issues. I'm really excited to be on this panel today uh, with everybody and speak about um, welcoming. Um, welcome to me means uh, connection, respect and peace would be three words to sum it up. That is very on point. I see you've come prepared, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Emil? If you could please introduce yourself. So uh, I would also like to first and foremost acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians. Uh, I'm sitting, speaking on the land of the Waka Waka uh, people. And I just want to acknowledge uh, their hard work, acknowledge the elders past and present for, I guess, looking after the land that I stand on and work on and uh, enjoy. So I'm Iyo Lubaha. I was born uh, in a small refugee camp in Tanzania. I uh, then spent most of my early teenage years in a refugee camp in Zimbabwe. So I uh, moved here 10 years ago through the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees Resettlement Program. And so 10 years in Australia and I have had uh, privileges and opportunities to go to uh, uh, school and I have had a, a different opportunities as well to actively work hard to uh, advocate and really look at building the bridges between refugees and uh, the mainstream Australian community. So uh, I we live and uh, work uh, here in uh, a working shed, so I uh, came here towards the end of last year. And uh, before that, I was uh, a president of the Rwandan Community Association of Queensland. And I uh, have done a lot of work in that community, as well as uh, currently part of the Multicultural Youth Council in Queensland here, where we pretty much advocate uh, and speak for the needs of young people. So I do hope that this conversation allow me time to reflect on my refugee experience uh, and reflect on what that, uh, I guess, the responsibility that comes with the privilege of living here in Australia. And uh, coming to your word on a welcome, for me, I look welcome as acceptance uh, destiny as well as uh, belonging. 
So those are three basic words which I summarize as my meaning for welcome. And uh, once again, cheers for having me uh, in this uh, uh, forum. And I look forward to share as well as natural insights from uh, my uh, colleagues who are with us. Thank you, Emil. And we'll throw it to you, Garen. Great. Um, so I might just shake things up a bit and I'll start with my uh, definition of welcome. Um, for me, welcome means two things. Um, firstly, it means sovereignty. Um, you're being welcomed oh. onto country by people who have sovereignty over that place. Uh, the second thing that it means, and, and this is going back to uh, the translation of the word that we use most commonly known for welcome, I may have said this in the uh, Welcome to Country, but the word that we use is woman jacker. And uh, woman jacker isn't so much uh, welcome, but rather more of a challenge. And uh, what it means is it's telling somebody, uh, directing someone, I should say, to come with purpose. Um, so what is the purpose that you're here for? Um, now, having said that, uh, sort of describing myself, I'm a... Juris Doctor candidate. Um, I've been working in uh, commercial business and not-for-profit business. I've been working for my community for the last seven years, uh, the Boonarong Foundation. Um, I would describe myself as a bridge builder um, in a lot of the work that I've been doing lately, um, building bridges between uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, um, helping them understand uh, or mostly for non-Indigenous Australians, what reconciliation is, um, why uh, why we're all in this together, uh, why we need to be all in this together, um, and actually make them realise that reconciliation is an actual thing. It's not just actions that we do. It's also something that we hope to achieve one day so that we can actually live and breathe um, this idea of reconciliation that we have. Um, and that... That's pretty much me in a nutshell, but that's my that's my purpose. That's the purpose that I come here for um, and to share the experience that I have. Like you said at the start, you know, I'm not an expert. I can only talk about how I've seen things through my eyes, uh, the experiences that I've gained from the people that came before me, people like my mum, uh, my aunties, uh, my uncles, all those people that passed that knowledge to me and passed their experiences to me. That's all I have to share. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm just somebody that has some experiences. Oh, thank you, Karen. And I suppose on that note, um, I am I'm Shabnam. Uh, I, similar to Emil, also came to Australia actually not that long ago. Um, although it feels like I've lived here all my life, I came uh, with my family as Afghan refugees uh, in 2009. I was a rowdy teenager at that time, I'm seeing now trying to figure life out <laughs> and being uh, thrown into, a, I suppose, the deep end of life at, at, at that stage, at that age at least. Um, you know, I, I came, we came from Pakistan, so I grew up as a refugee in Pakistan and then we came to Australia around that time, um, unusual for a lot of the families, but we came as a whole family together at the same time, um, which, you know, has its um, had its moments. Uh, it's It hasn't been easy, and I don't assume it's easy for anyone who just comes to a very foreign land. I think all I knew about Australia was um, big buildings, fancy cars and things that I had seen on TV. I, My world before coming to Australia was actually very small. I um, didn't know much outside a small town that I lived in. Um, and coming to Australia, I think a lot of my assumptions were challenged. Um, that, you know, how can I, I had actually uh, assumed that Australia would be a land of people with blonde hair and blue eyes <laughs> and how we, we have, uh, you know, people coming from all corners of the world, really, but how we still function so well and uh, so beautifully as a community. Um, 
has has certainly uh, taught me a lot of things. And, and as a as a refugee teenager, I suppose I went through many phases of life. Um, in in the life of a refugee, uh, you know, I, uh, I was actually the only one who knew a little bit of English with my family, um, within my family, and so. Uh, a lot of uh, what was tough for everyone, I would say, was a little tougher for me because it included uh, 24-7 translations and interpretations. Um, <laughs> but we've, we've figured out, I think, uh, 10 years down the track or 11 years down the track, we have sort of uh, found our feet in this community and we have felt, um, a, you know, throughout our time within uh growing um, in Australia together. And, you know, I, I, I think of it as um, not just myself growing up here. Uh, like, you know, my family, we all came together. And so we all sort of started from a clean slate. Everyone's growing together here, uh, finding our um, place in the community and in Australia. And uh, on that, I have done uh, quite a bit of work within the refugee and newly arrived communities, trying to, you know, make that, that process a little easier for others who have come after me. I have uh, worked um, with many other young people from the community, um, co-founded multiple initiatives, trying to, uh, you know, help uh anyone else who would have been who is in my shoes and what I would have wanted to do um what I would have wanted someone else to do for me when I was in that stage I've always tried to give back a little bit currently I um I wear a lot of hats I um my day job is within the Centre for Multicultural Youth in Victoria, working with uh, newly arrived refugee uh, young people or migrant young people from culturally diverse backgrounds to try and make and be influential agents, you know, in the Australian society and um, make positive change. And also as they're making Australia their home, I also, uh, by I suppose by education, I uh, study or have studied uh, neurosciences. I don't know what I'm going to do with that qualification. <laughs> um, and I uh, also try and do a little bit of culture, um, equity and diversity and inclusion uh, work within, especially within the not-for-profit sector, just trying to make sense of what all of that means for all of us coming from very different backgrounds and um, also a part of the newly established National Refugee-Led Advocacy and Advisory Group. More on that. Um, later once we go uh, further down. Um, I suppose for me, welcome uh, means being acknowledged for who I am and as I am, as a whole, like, you know, um, that is a lot more than three words, isn't it? <laughs> I suppose being acknowledged to contribute fully to a community um, that I'm being welcomed in. Moving on sure. and to kick things off, I um, get this conversation going. Garen and Ashley, um, if either one of you or both of you really could talk to, uh, talk to say, me and Emil here about what welcome to country signifies for you, like, you know, um, in, in, in your cultures. Uh, as myself, I... Being honest, um, for a very long time, I did not understand this concept when I had just come to Australia. I found it very foreign um, and didn't really know much about it. No one really taught me much about it. Um, so for the likes of me 10 years ago. Garen, you can kick off. You did the welcome tonight, so you can start. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, it feels like a lifetime ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, look, welcome to country. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, it's not something that's unique to one part or one community in Australia. And in, in a lot of ways, there are traditions across the world that have something similar to what a welcome to country is. And I relate it um, to my experiences and, and what I know as um, what we call Tandarum. Now, Tandarum is... Um, it starts with that 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 um, direction, which is to come with purpose, mm -hmm. um, and it's followed by um, what we call a promise. So a promise to adhere to certain um, 
you know, given that you've been accepted for that purpose to adhere to certain protocols, um, what we would have been calling, uh, what you could call today customary laws, so laws of etiquette, um, depending on which community you're coming into. Um, but there was a, you know, it, it's not just the promise of, uh, you know, um, I will promise to you. It's, it's, a, it's an exchange of promises. So you're coming onto someone's country um, for the right purpose and you're adhering to those certain protocols. Um, there's also an understanding that you'll be safe while you're on country, while you're trying to achieve whatever purpose it is that you've come from. Um, and, and we call that uh, Tandarum. Um, uh, we have our own list of protocols in the Kulin Nation. Um, I think I went over them a little bit in the Welcome to Country. So if you're curious about that, just go back and watch that. <laughs> um, I think Welcome to Country means to me um, being mindful of where you are and understanding the ownership of the country and where you are and acknowledging the history of the country and standing where you are. And, um, you know, as we pass through different suburbs, uh, you see different signs and you make a note of it. Um, okay, I'm now in, well, I'm in Sydney, so okay, I'm in Brighton, Los Angeles, that's where I'm right now. Well, oh, I'm in Mascot, you're passing through the different boundaries and borders. And you're knowing that where you are, there's um, certain characteristics to that place, but then when it comes to our, our cultures as Aboriginal people, we're actually, I like to think of it, we're multicultural people because um, there's all of our clans and tribes where we have our own uh, individual and unique um, languages, stories uh, that must be respected each time you pass onto a different land. Um, like Garen said, it's also like having safe passage. So um, mm -hmm. as I'm travelling around, I always make sure that I'm acknowledging where I am and I take comfort in knowing that being respectful, that things will be okay while I'm there and that ancestors are looking out for me. Um, it, it's really important. It's, it's a really, really important thing to do. Uh, I know that there's um, just recently in Sydney um, a Hillshire councillor. Um, my brother lives out in that, in that district. It's kind of near Blacktown area. Uh, has refused to do a, a welcome or acknowledgement. Um, have any of those during any proceedings that she will be she'll be attending and uh, that's really disappointing especially you know in 2020 um, to acknowledge especially out in Western Sydney there is a rich um, Aboriginal history there uh, so we're still battling with people trying to find the importance of this and to to really respect it and make sure they uh, have it as part of their everyday lives but it's more about being mindful in where you are and remembering that this always was and will be Aboriginal land. Absolutely. Um, Emil, I just would like to, you know, get your understanding or um, interpretation of being welcome uh, or, and developing that sense of belonging in, in a country or a land that, you know, you didn't grow up in. Sure. So uh, I guess for me, when I moved here as well 10 years ago, uh, the concept was very, very strange. And I remember in the process of coming to Australia, uh, we were informed that Australia is a land of opportunities. Australia is a land where you can go and be anything you want, which is very true. And uh, something we were not fully exposed to was the extent and uh, the systematic gaps that exist between First Nations and the wider uh, Australian community. And uh, for me, well, each time I, uh, I, 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 I get a welcome, I do feel a sense of connection and a sense of you are one of us moving forward we are together on this land. So uh, I see respect and I see being valued. And mm -hmm. I, see, uh, I see it as an opportunity to reflect on who I am and what is it that I can share and what is it that I can learn from other First Nations community. 
So that's one thing. And the second thing is around uh, acceptance and responsibility to leave that land in a better state. Uh, in a culture, usually uh, uh, when you visit, you either go with the gift or you either go with the token. Or when you leave, you leave something behind. Uh, this is something I was taught by my family and by my Rwandan community that you should always strive to leave the place in a far better condition than how you find it. Mm. So connecting that to, I guess, the notion of being welcomed and being able to belong on a land which is not yours, uh, it has in with what is my role and what is it that I can do to leave this country in a much more far better condition. So uh, each time I get welcomed, I am reminded to, to proactively do something rather than being a passive consumer. So uh, that's the way I view it. And uh, now, if I was to reflect, I guess, how life has been in the last 10 years ago, I wish someone, uh, I guess, in the process of coming to Australia, that sort of concept uh, being introduced before coming in would have helped. Yeah. And it would have helped if that concept was taught by First Nation. So uh, this is what I guess uh, when we advocate for the gaps and the need to facilitate smoother transition, the work that uh, Gavin does a lot, uh, a little bit of exposure to those concepts, to our communities and allow us to be part of the journey. Yeah, it's. Um, I think I resonate with that very much myself as well. You know, the yeah. um, the lack of information or knowledge, and you know, yeah. when I was little, I well, not very little, but when before we were coming to Australia, I had told a friend uh, where we were going, and I remember her. I remember very well her saying, "Oh, Australia, you're going to paradise." You know, Australia mm. is considered a country at the same level as a paradise because of the opportunities that you get, because of like you know the resources that are available to you, and people um, long um, for coming to to come here. And I think for me, it was a very um, a harsh awakening to to mm. realize or to then learn the the dark history behind Australia's success um and exactly as you said I mean like I, I've always questioned why aren't we told about this like you know I remember being oriented or being briefed in a room about life in Australia and what to do and what to know um you know, um, they taught us things about um Vegemite, right? <laughs> Something um, I can. Why, uh, why, is, why is the history um, beyond fe uh, before Federation, before White okay. Australia? Why is that not talked about so much? And um, you know, uh, I feel like as uh, as people who come to this country, um, well, myself actually, I spent a very um, many numbers of the initial years completely unaware and and I keep thinking back to how much I have you know unknowingly uh, have probably disrespected people or their um, their heritage without knowing any of these things and you know you uh, when you come to a new country for a little while you're also in a honeymoon phase you know everything there is great you, can't, you just can't bring yourself to believe that it's anything that goes against this new home, um, this new um, safe haven that you have you found yourself in, um, and so for me it was a very uh, it, it was an eye opening um, really, and it didn't happen straight away. It was like you know over years of um, talking and learning more, and I just wish we as newcomers we didn't have to catch up. Um, so much, right? Like and, you just just tell us, um, uh, let us know, or inform us about the history of this nation. Like you know, whatever whatever it is, just mm -hmm. it's good for um, the communities who find themselves uh, in in new position here to know 
all of that. So then we can, you know, something really I can, feel I guess, like also add to your something I can quickly add up to your uh, uh, your comments is that there's there's a narrative which seems very awkward to share, and there's a narrative which is barely spoken in schools, barely spoken in communities, and this is the narrative you get when you live and experience your a life in Australia from a First Nations perspective. Mm. And I uh, I do applaud Ashley and Brother Gavin, uh, I guess, for what they do in uh, in presenting a new story and presenting a new narrative. And uh, this these are so this is the narrative we were never exposed to. Yeah. I guess in the process and in our early days here. So uh, I acknowledge that it's an, it will take time, but those, that awkward narrative is a narrative which must be spoken to reconcile mm. and to heal and to close the gaps. Yeah, and I suppose just on that, Garen, um, what, what, what do you think, as obvious as it might be, is holding back progress in that step um, mm. towards achieving true um, reconciliation, right? You know, in 1967, we know the referendum that granted some rights in Australia to First Nations people. Um, what do you think, what, what's your takeaway um, since then and what else needs to be done? Well, to sort of talk about, um, you know, 1967 um, and, you know, the following what we might call a cultural renaissance uh, where Aboriginal artworks and uh, culture was popularised and, uh, you know, we got the sort of generic idea of what an Aboriginal person is and we've been uh, trying to create the uh, reconciliation based on that idea of what an Aboriginal person was. It was developed in like the 70s, early, you know, early 60s. And... Um, the Indigenous people of Australia have been on a different journey. So uh, given the freedom to explore their cultures and identities, um, to go back to their elders and, and, and learn their languages again and, um, you know, to gain what was lost, the journey has changed uh, or the, the idea has changed. And, and even now, you know, Indigenous communities across Australia, you know, especially in Victoria, New South Wales, and, and, and on the eastern side, there have been, uh, you know, uh, Melbourne, for instance, um, we, we're starting to gain back our identity in a lot of ways. And what we're realising is that we're very different. We have unique stories and customs that are unique to our parts of the country. And there's no need to borrow things from other parts of Australia. Um the problem is that it's there's two different journeys going in two different directions, um, and non-Indigenous Australia doesn't understand uh, what cultural identity is because it, it's changing, um, or it, or or it never has changed, but it was different to what we thought it was. Um, the generic idea of an Aboriginal person is not accurate anymore, um, so we kind of have to battle with that. From the Indigenous community, we have to battle with the fact that we are different, but we have um, the same purpose or the same aspirations. And that's why we uh, we come together, you know, to the protests, you know. Um, we come together under a, a unified flag that represents all of us. Um, what can we do um, to change that? You know, how do we, I mean, Aboriginal values have to be put at the forefront. Um, Aboriginal culture and identity needs to be um, visible. It needs to be. It needs to have a prominent place uh, in who we are as Australians. It needs to be statues on the streets. It needs mm -hmm. to be street names. It needs to be everywhere, um, so that we can start changing that idea of what uh, you know an Aboriginal person is from the perspectives of a non-Indigenous person. I I, I think. Um, you know, uh, this is something that is not only important to Indigenous people, but it's important to all people, whether you're fifth-generation Australian 
um, whether you're first generation Australian or you're newly arrived to Australia, you know, we all we're, we're, we're um, we have we 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 experience a form of oppression if we're not granted this kind of knowledge, the knowledge about the land, the knowledge about all the beautiful stories that I could tell you about. I mean, you've probably been in uh, Melbourne or parts of Australia for long parts of your life, but, you know, I could show you things as a traditional owner that would open your eyes and you'd realise that you've never experienced the city uh, of Melbourne, the area of Melbourne, the way I have. And it, it, it could be an eye-opening experience if you allow us to do it. So um, I was having this conversation before about Aboriginal statues. You know, they were talking about you know, we, we need to tear down all the statues. And I said, well, what we really need to do is build some statues. You know, we need to build some statues of those um, those figures that were so prominent during the time and uh, in some cases saved the lives of the first settlers, you know, ironically. Um, yeah. uh, we need to pay respects to those people, our ancestors, and they need to be up there in the front, not just so people that want to find the information, because there are a lot of people, uh, at least in Melbourne, that live in this very progressive bubble and they want to be uh, 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 culturally sensitive, but there's a lot of people that don't. They're not interested in it, and it's got to be there for those people as well. Yeah, I suppose in a way so many of us live in in this bubble of, you know, oblivion and completely unaware of the very rich history of the lands we're walking on and working on and playing on. Um, and I agree with absolutely everything you said. There needs to be more conversation. There needs to be more dialogue. And I suppose from, like, you know, as, as members of refugee communities to members of Indigenous communities, maybe we just need to take the middleman out. Like, you know, we just start this dialogue and the more we learn, the more we can educate others. Um, and on that, uh, Ashley, I was, uh, you know, thinking about how much of agency, agency or not even agency, um, consultation do Aboriginal communities or First Nations voices have or how much they are consulted on issues of refugee and asylum seekers in this country. Like, you know, we're talking about um, hostile policies towards First Nations people uh, many years ago and continuing and in, you know, some ways very hostile uh, policies towards refugee communities as well. Um, um, how much uh, do Indigenous voices uh need to be included in those um, making of the refugees, um, the policies for refugees and asylum seekers in this country. You know, as we're talking about the concept of welcome. Um, mm. Yeah, no, I think there is definitely a place for First Nations in all aspects of policy making in this country. As Aboriginal people, all things affect us in this country. We pay taxes, we use the education system we drive on roads just like everybody else so that's something that would be consulted on on a federal policy making level but in regards to refugee policy I think that First Nations should also be consulted it's uh, almost like thinking um, if you came over to my house and you wanted to ask how to I don't know set the table and I'll just give you some ideas of maybe how we might like it here I'm, I'm not really sure I haven't really ever thought about this but you know it's um having acknowledgement of who, who's of the country that we're living on um yeah they should really be playing a part we should be able to be consulted in that and have collaboration with, with um the refugee community and um, there's so many parallels there in experiences and culture I can't help but imagine what a different country we would have if, you know, as Garen said, um, the Indigenous community had all the say in um, refugee policies, uh, what this, um, this, these communities or what this country would look like. I can't. Um, mm. I, I keep. I, if only. I, right? If only. I, I, think, I think that um, our, our parliaments and our councils and, uh, you know, boards and things, they should really reflect what our community is looking like and, um, you know, 
women, LGBTI community, people with disabilities, and on every single one of those, First Nations people should be leading those processes. Um, so I think that the more that th those uh, leadership spaces and, and policy making positions reflect the lived experiences of the people they're advocating for, um, I think that there'd be a lot more of a robust policy um, platform being presented to the public and something that is a lot more fair um, and equitable. Um, I was just going to speak around uh, if uh, I've had a chance to engage and learn about uh, the local First Nations culture. And uh, in the last, for say, two, three years, I have sort of identified that there's a lot and a lot of things in common between refugee asylum communities and the First Nations. And I think uh, it would be in the best interest of I uh, even look at the local level resettlement programs to start engaging and having conversations with First Nations on uh, what is it that can be done to create a home for all of us? And what role can our First Nations our community play to speed up or to ensure a smooth transition uh, and integration? So uh, pretty much just uh, echoing the words of Ashley, the First Nations voice needs to be heard across the board. Mm. And, uh, and in the lens of, uh, you know, from someone who uh, came at such a young age and have had, have had an experience to grow and live and work with the First Nations young people, there's a lot and a lot of things that could be done to sort of bridge the gaps and to really empower that sense of belonging and personal identity. So uh, I do see a huge, huge gap and a need for the First Nations voice to be part of the process in policy and in how we advocate for the needs of our communities. And yeah, yeah I just wanted to draw like a point of um, how kind of, if you think about it mm. in a way, it's quite similar. You know, I've I'd never lived technically on my country. My country mm -hmm. is 400 kilometres west of where I am. Mm. So uh, due to, you know, past policies and the displacement and dispossession of people of their lands and their stories, um, forced to live on another country, you know, grew up in Durham mm. country and now I'm in Bidjigal country. Um, and you have that connection to that place. But I bet just like you guys, I long for my country. I'll feel it and I'll have to jump in the car and drive out there and see family. And um, mm. and I'm lucky enough that I get to do that. I mean, not everybody in the refugee community is able to, you know, go back to their countries and reconnect. And and um, and it, it's almost like, uh, I don't know, having a satisfying drink of water or something. It's just nourishing and re-energizes you because I know when I'm there and and I, I can tell when I've come back to Sydney just the difference um mm. and, and um yeah it's just always it does call you so it's that connection to country mm. so yeah. when things settle down actually we'll take you to Africa I'll take you to Rwanda excellent <laughs> as well as Kevin <laughs> I keep thinking about um, as you know, Emil, Emil has said that there is there is connection, there is shared experiences and common bonds in whatever way we find it. Right, I feel like as human beings, we we long for that that kind of connection um, and shared experiences. I just keep thinking about how much of this information or this knowledge isn't available out there. Nick, how much do we we really don't know? And, you know, what Ashley was saying earlier, that if we had better representation, if our, um, you know, if our media, if our leaders, if our parliament looked like um, a true representation of our communities and the lived experiences, we wouldn't have had to have these sort of discussions of how to bridge that gap of information and knowledge and um 
you know, for for refugee communities or any newcomer newcoming communities to not be playing catch up after you know many many years after they come to realize and learn more about this country. I suppose I just want to uh, explore what role you think, um, and maybe Emil, um, you think settlement agencies have in this space. We have touched on it briefly about the lack of information about Aboriginal communities before we come to Australia. Um, but once we do come here, um, once we do start a life, what role do you think they have in, in bridging this gap that we are talking about right now? You got Gavin. Well, um, I think <laughs> one of the issues here <laughs> is that um, for the last two hundred years, we've had uh, non-Indigenous Australians here, and during that time, they've done very little learning of uh, Indigenous culture, Indigenous voice, um, and so when new people come to this country um, for whatever reason, you know, as a refugee in extreme circumstances, you know, or, um, you know, f some other means, they're, they're being invited by people that you could say they're probably the worst students of the class, you know, that they're not going to pass on the knowledge or uh, an understanding of um, what Australia is, uh, our country. Um, you know, they're going to probably think that the more important thing to talk about is Vegemite and uh, you need to pick an AFL team when you when you come here too. Um, none of which connects new people um, that come here to live for whatever reason to the land that they will soon call home. Um, and I think that's the problem. Uh, what is the solution? Um I think I said it before, you know, we, we need a stronger Indigenous voice um, in, in these uh, more uh, cultural identity out in the forefront of our uh, everything that we do. Uh, I just wanted to um, make a comment too. Garen was also speaking about um, uh, probably a couple of questions ago about the need for statues just I don't live far from where Captain Cook actually landed. And uh, just down the road from me is uh, Cook Park. It runs right across the beach. And there's this big, beautiful brass boat uh, paying tribute to the Endeavour. And there's two Australian flags and a lovely little plaque. And, and my partner and I go for walks and see it and we think there really needs to be something there about the frontier wars. Mm. Something about mm. first contact and the conflicts that, you know, carried on across this country. Um, having those sorts of, uh, you know, statues and, and monuments is one part, I think, definitely of uh, getting people to ask questions and, and also as a reminder and seeing that, uh, that it's there. Um I think a big problem in possibly part of the information that gets passed on to um, people coming to Australia is is the the icons of Vegemite and and um, the Harbour Bridge and the AFL teams because it's almost like Aboriginal history is being written out of history, mm. and um, I, I think so. Uh, in a past job, I was working as a school teacher, and um, this is actually what influenced me to want to get into policy and, and then into politics is because I could be that one teacher in that those 30 kids lives 30 kids in my class and they could go on to have 12 other teachers that would not teach them anything about Aboriginal history culture it would be very tokenistic on a NAIDOC day or a reconciliation week to do something you know red black and yellow but not you know just scratching the surface it's such mm -hmm. a deep and beautiful yeah. And, and also traumatic history that everyone should really um, embrace with integrity and respect and courage because it's something we should all be um, proud to move forward and accept together. I think that's all really unify the country. Um, but 
why I got into policy is because I thought that this isn't happening enough and not enough history is being taught. I can't guarantee that, you know, these kids are going to be influenced by my couple of lessons. So that's why I wanted to get into policy and make sure that it was something that happened across the board, that this was mandatory standards that teachers would have to adhere to and their principles and um and, and people are still working in that space. There are a lot of representative bodies in the education system. I think it's definitely a big part of education and the education sector. I think that Reconciliation Australia, which is the national body um, working towards reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians could play such a big part, uh, bigger part. Um, they've done such a, you know, they play such a big part said part so many times but um I think that they could really drive truth telling in this country and it's it's nothing I don't think that it's not, it's anything that um you know people feel should feel ashamed about um you know as uh white Australians hearing stories and they'll say well it they could say well it wasn't me that did it I I don't care about it we're not saying it was you and I'm not saying that, you know, it was me back then, but this is something that we have to learn together and to grow. Um, and almost if you think about it, how history can repeat history, you know, you, you learn patterns in history. Um, all of that education is only going to make us stronger as a country. And I think the, as we see the prime minister at the moment um, and his lack of leadership in, you know, really, advocating for First Nations people and Aboriginal deaths in custody that maybe if he cared about the history a little bit more and really wanted to, you know, um, have a prosperous future, uh, you know, with that rich history with First Nations people, then that would be a totally different game. But, um, yeah. and you see those kinds of things, people that have the guts to, to own up to the history and to say it proud, and then you see ones that are cowering away from it. Yeah. 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 Neil, did you did you have anything to say on that as well? So uh, I was just going to emphasize on the need for a new narrative, and I, as I said a little bit earlier, uh, a lot of refugee asylum communities have uh, a particular narrative that were presented, and this goes back to uh, before they actually are. Uh, picked up from a refugee camp to here. So uh, the earlier, I guess, the concept, the question you brought in around the role of settlement services. Uh, for me, I'll go a step back and I, and as part of that, uh, those seminars and trainings that refugees go through before being brought here, I think if, that opportunity could be utilized to share this narrative. There's a lot of uh, First Nations practice, practices and values that uh, I think would benefit and uh, inform and above all uh, ensure a very, very smooth transition. So uh, and I from that, there's a need as well for uh, settlement services who are the first point of contact. I, 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 I do, I would hope that, I guess, as these conversations start to, to open up, there'll be, a, I guess, opportunities for Indigenous to be part of those settlement services as well. When we welcome uh, a new refugee in asylum to Australia, what sort of impression do they get from uh, the first time they step on this land and how does that impression inform their journey? So while uh, settlement services do have a massive, massive role to play and I, and I think now is the time to really point and I, I guess advocate for a space for an indigenous voice in that area. And I think that will lead us to have those awkward conversations as mm. well as things like honest uh, truth-telling. It's sometimes truth can be painful, but uh, we need to be mature and we don't need to uh, present those narratives which are barely uh, discussed. 
which are considered to be awkward. So uh, massive, massive need for settlement services to include uh, First Nations uh, voice yeah. in how they deliver their services. Absolutely. I think it has far-reaching consequences, really, um, the the lack of knowledge, uh, the the information, I suppose, you know, when you come to a country from a very precarious situation yourself, like, you know, the first few years, at least, you have so much to think about, like, you know, if, if you are... Um, thinking about some of our community members who are on very um, uh, not great visas, you know, on either on temporary protection visas or um, bridging visas, hoping to, to gain permanent residency and how much, and I just keep thinking about how much this lack of knowledge and the lack of narrative really hurts uh, that process. Um, like, you know, what, yeah, what's means to someone like that like you know when you do if if someone um, uh, does receive their citizenship what does that really mean um, you know in a way the uh, I'd say settlement services or organizations uh, a lot of the practices a lot of the focus is dictated by white systems established 200 years ago, right? And we, we have not acknowledged, I think, the, the sector or this um, sphere hasn't, hasn't even acknowledged that yet, that when we are welcoming newcomers, new refugees, new um, people seeking asylum in the community, what are we really welcoming them into? And um, mm. should we be doing the welcome? Should it be us? Um, and something I can also really, which came into my attention was around uh, next week could be Refugee Week and June 20 will be uh, World Refugee Day. And some of the parallels I see between refugees and asylums, I, I see resilience and I reflecting I, in my experience in a refugee camp, we had to be people who were resilient and people who how I saw hope and uh, people who were able to go through adversity with optimism and hope that things will someday be better. And this is uh, a spirit I also uh, have I, and I do acknowledge from the First Nations that uh, we are people defined by resilience and hard work and commitment to certain values. And I think I, I guess, trying to uh, draw the spirit of what next uh, week will look like, uh, the spirit of you know, these sort of values we see uh, between us and the First Nations. These are the values which, uh, when we look at welcoming new asylums and refugees, uh, citizenship ceremonies. How can we draw from these values and will empower new Australians to be part of this new narrative? So uh, that's something I thought I guess I would draw and uh, I guess acknowledging our shared values uh, yeah. that can be utilised to redefine a new uh, a new agenda. Yeah, I suppose on yeah. that, Karen and Ashley. You know, talking about narrative, talking about taking agency of your own, our own narrative. What do you think we need to do to to make sure that happens? That you know, we own our own voices and experiences. Um, I think we need to start uh, in terms of what we do um, uh, as Indigenous Australians. Um, I think we need to uh, stop applauding people that um, virtual signal and sort of uh, take credit for, uh, uh, you know, uh, not credit. Um, someone put it really beautifully and I'm struggling to, but um, they sort of, they, they appropriate the cultural capital of uh, other people, and and we saw this recently uh, during the uh, recent um, 
protests in America where a lot of big companies uh, uh, used uh, the Black Lives Matter hashtag. Um, and this is nothing new. This is uh, something that's been done for a while. We're living in an age where people uh, now account for a company's goodwill and their, 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 uh, how, how proactive they are in being socially responsible. But um, I think one of the biggest issues is that they, they seem to think that the um, attaching themselves to the virtue of something is just as good as uh, doing things that add value. Um, and in Australia, you know, one of the issues we have, um, and, you know, I won't say every organisation that has a reconciliation action plan does this, but um, at least uh, from my community, uh, we, we tend to see uh, oh. sometimes these wraps can be used as a tick the box, tick the box kind of mm -hmm. process um, because it's attached to some kind of value and it's used as this virtually signal, virtual signal virtue signaling tool where they can say look at us we have a elevate wrap um and 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 these are the people that are supposed to be the the top of the pyramid when it comes to cultural competence right um and we all know what happened i'm not sure if anyone knows actually uh what happened to uh, rio tinto and their reconciliation action plan recently um all that work for for nothing right um, so we need to stop applauding people just because they follow our hashtag, just because they do a reconciliation action plan or they say that they're um, supporting refugees or whatever cause it is. And I think we need to start holding people to the fire and saying, look, you know, this isn't about you getting some virtual signaling, signaling points out of this. This is about you seeing and identifying the value of who we are you know, the value, because that's what people stick to at the end. They don't, they'll, they'll give up their virtues when time gets hard. And when, you know, COVID hits, they'll forget about their welcome to countries and they'll forget about uh, their acknowledgements and, and they'll focus on what they value. And if they don't value us, um, I think we're sending the wrong message. I think, um, I think uh, we're giving them the wrong things to focus on. And, and and whenever I work with an organisation, I always start with why do you even want to do this? You know, if it's not something that it's in your value, that you, you can't identify the value of having an inclusive environment, for instance, right, or um, uh, having a stronger Indigenous voice or, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. If you don't see the value in that, don't do it. Yeah. Because I think um, eventually people are going to start catching up. I think they're already starting to catch up. Uh, and they're going to see these sort of statements that people do for what they are. Um, but I think it does need to start with us um, and we need to stop applauding uh, people for doing things that doesn't that don't really matter. Yeah, yeah. Ashley? Um, yeah, I, I just think that uh, it definitely comes with the truth-telling is the start. And I completely agree with the virtue signalling that mm. actions speak louder than words and uh, actions also, you know, ensure that um, we're addressing the problems. And uh, I've been feeling overwhelmed by seeing so much support um, and, you know, I'm not the filter of who's genuine and who's not, but there's, you know, I, I've, you know, witnessed a lot of... Uh, virtue signaling um yeah. and a lot of that empty support and that's not what's going to you know especially in this case right now that's not what's going to stop uh deaths in custody that's not what's going to help aboriginal people um in in the current state i think that yeah just really acknowledging how um the impacts of colonization you know we've um we've had people coming to australia for thousands of years. Um, today's actually the 160th anniversary of the Afghan Kamalis. Um, Macassans have been uh, trading with the Yongu people in NT for, you know, they're basically the first um, treaty that we've ever had. So working peacefully with people from other countries is not something foreign to First Nations people in this country. 
but I guess it's the disrespect, it's the uh, it's the horrible, you know, genocide um, that was forced under First Nations people. Um, to to I guess is where we are now, and um, it, it really needs that genuine support um, and actions from people from the refugee community, from all communities, um, to stand up against um, the people just wanting to uh, have tokenism ongoing in their workplace, like Garen was saying, the reconciliation action plans, um, asking questions and feeling, knowing that your questions are legitimate and if they're coming from a real place of wanting to, you know, be welcomed in the country and wanting to work with First Nations people, you have every right to ask these questions Um, and it's through that education and and that dialogue that First Nations people will know more about the lived experiences of people in the refugee community and uh, vice versa. They'll also understand um, First Nations struggles and also their their hopes for the future. Yeah, Hmm. that's very important and I think just conscious of time as well. I wanted to add something to what Emil said earlier. I, I don't know if you are saying it as a joke or you know, there's a little bit of truth in that. Um, you know, in terms of the refugee community and uh, the Indigenous community, maybe we do need to start cutting, cutting out the middleman and, and maybe we do need to come together uh, with some of the similar values that we have and similar purpose that we have and we really sort of work together because what's in place now isn't working. You know, um, uh, people coming here and not sort of being able to connect to the country f- through the first peoples that live here, yeah. um, which yeah. could play a great role um, in sort of, you know, unifying us as a community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's very that true. That wasn't, it wasn't a joke. It was very uh, real that uh, we need to really exploit and use uh, uh, the values we share to mm. change the narrative. And I uh, hanging around it and spending time with young people from across the state. So I've engaged with people, young people from uh, discrete, indigenous or uh, discrete communities. I have worked, talked, engaged with young people from down further south, to all the way up in the northern parts of Queensland. There's so much uh, in common that we could draw upon to uh, change the narrative. So uh, I think this is perfect timing to be having these sort of conversations. There's great hope in this, and I this is I, I guess this is good timing. Okay, so uh, for uh, Emil, I, I, I think it's really important what you were talking about, Nick, you know, um, that lack of knowledge or narrative and what Ashley was saying as well. Um, what do you think we as refugee communities need to do uh, right now, starting from right here, to, to develop that sort that allyship with the First Nations communities and, you know, make sure that we are on the right side, that we are contributing to the healing of First Nations people and not to the like you know the ongoing colonization and settlement that we find ourselves deeply entrenched in from the moment we come to this country as as refugee communities. What's our responsibility really? So uh, well, <laughs> what a question. But uh, one thing I can uh, first and foremost lay out is that refugees do have a need for healing. So as First Nations. And uh, refugees do have a need to be heard and to be acknowledged and to be supported on that journey of healing. This is a common trend that we share with our brothers and sisters in the First Nations community. So why uh, one message I tell uh, a lot of, especially young people uh, from our refugee slash asylum communities is to... Uh, take time to learn and take time to listen. And I uh, take time to explore. And uh, there's a lot, I'm looking at even things around opportunities. There's a lot of things we can uh, learn and share 
and uh, as part of our healing process. And I'm part of an organization called Initiatives of Change, which looks at uh, personal transformation as the basis of, uh, have, I guess, uh, uh, as the basis of impacting or as the best of inspiring change in others. So uh, when I look at the work we do, which is around story sharing, uh, what is it that I have gone through that actually may benefit from and uh, Gavin and yourself, uh, Chapman? And uh, that's for me the, uh, I guess, initial stage around, let's start to have those conversations with our brothers and sisters from the First Nations. Let's heal and heal together. And uh, the second element is around opportunities. Tap into those areas which seem foreign and go in and uh, acknowledge that it may take time and effort to hit that mark, but really expose yourself and be ready to be used and be ready to also uh, use whatever you can. And uh, my last point is around uh, commitment and time. Uh, as a young person, I have a privilege of time and I have a privilege to make an impact in that space of time. So uh, let's use time in our favor and uh, let's really use it to close those gaps. So I believe that the timing is now. This is the time to have these conversations. And this is the time to act on those conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Emil. Um, very powerful. And uh, Garen, I'll come to you for your last comments on on what Emil has said as well. Like, you know, this is the time and um, we need to yeah. start. I could maybe relate it to some language uh, that I might have used before, but um, I, I talked about um, the different laws that we have in this country, one being Australian common law, another one being Indigenous customary law. And uh, this is one of the customary laws uh, of the Kulin Nations, um, and we call it Jambana. And what it means is uh, bringing the coming together of people that are different, that have different experiences, um, and harnessing those uh, different capabilities uh, but also identifying the things that we have in common. And I think Emil's done that perfectly. You know, we, we do need to heal. And uh, maybe we can help each other heal. And maybe we can work together um, to create a shared future that is um, inclusive of all of us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Karen. Ashley? Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to, final thoughts, was touch on what you said earlier, Shabnam, when you're coming to Australia and uh, telling your friend um, that you were coming here and she said, wow, it's paradise, it's a safe haven and, you know, refugee week and, um, the, you know, it's the week of welcome. Well, yeah, we First Nations people want to welcome, you know, and we do welcome um, the refugee community uh, here. Um it is a paradise, it is a safe haven, you know, and working together we can only make it better and stronger, I think. Yeah, and I suppose for me on that note it would be um, learning and, uh, and acknowledging that there is so much I still don't know and I think I'm really going to take that um, mantra of taking the middle person out of this, like, you know, having these these one-on-one -on -one conversations and this dialogue um, and learning and healing together. I, I love that concept. And uh, for me personally, and I would like, I would like to say that for most of um, refugee communities, I think it's really important that we, we first see ourselves um, as, as colonised beings right and then start the process of decolonizing ourselves our thoughts there are still assumptions that I have that you know need to be challenged and I need to let go of and and learn and um, um, educate myself and others I really want to believe in peer education I feel like you know I don't have a lot of control over what happened in the past or generations before me but I can try and uh, change uh 
uh, mindsets of my generation, at least, or the ones coming after me as a meal set. Like, you know, the time is on our side right now. We, we need to use that time to, um, to do better, really. Um, I suppose there's a lot in common. Um, there's a lot we can learn uh, from our experiences, lived experiences that we've had in our respective uh, times and lives and um, really try and uh, put actions, um, have actions and not just words in sharing and creating a better community. Um, I think it would be good to uh, remind everyone, once again, the audience, that there will be a live Q&A panel after this at uh, Refugee Council of Australia's Facebook event, so jump on that straight away. Um, some of us are sticking behind to take some questions. Uh, and just as a uh, reminder once again that, you know, we would like to thank the Wheeler Centre for making this happen and getting all the technology sorted. Uh, it's <laughs> been an experience before. And um, Grace Edward, who would be joining us once again, who, who would be joining us at the Q&A panel. Um, and uh, go back to the Facebook event page or the Wheeler Centre event website or Refugee Council's website to find out more about uh, every one of us here and the work that we're currently doing and Refugee Council's work and about everything else that's happening during Refugee Week. So happy Refugee Week. <laughs> Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.